This video is all about automorphisms and Schwartz lemma. We'll start with the definition of an automorphism, specifically with the unit disk. However, this definition can be generalized to any open subset of C. So automorphism of the unit disk is the set of all functions that map the disk to itself such that F is biholomorphic. So one quick note, I used to think that F is in the automorphism of D is equivalent to saying that F just maps D to D, but because of our definition, that's not true. You also need to include that F is holomorphic and that F is bijective. And then those two statements are equivalent. So to understand what an automorphism is, we'll first talk about what an automorphism is not. So here are some examples of functions that are not automorphisms of D. For example, we can start off with the reflection. Even though it does map from D to D, it's not in the automorphism of D because F is not holomorphic. Another one is F of Z is equal to Z squared. But again, this is not an automorphism of D because F is not injective since two elements can be mapped to one. So then let's talk about what an automorphism is. And this really comes down to two categories. The first one is a rotation. This is a very easy to visualize and easy to understand automorphism since it clearly maps D to D, it is injective, and it is holomorphic. The other one is a very interesting example, um, but it comes up a lot and it's important to understand, and it's a function we will denote as phi sub alpha, and it's given by the formula written down. This is not something that I'd be able to come up with on my own, but it is just a very important concept in complex analysis in automorphisms. And phi sub alpha has some cool properties such that it maps a or alpha to zero and it also maps zero to alpha and it is equal to its inverse. The picture I drew above shows how this function phi sub alpha maps the unit disk to itself. Notice that you start at the center and you end up at this point a and that's why uh, phi sub alpha maps zero to a and back to itself. And so I can actually show that the inverse, since it's equal to itself, you can draw an arrow back and say that it maps back and forth from the unit disk to the unit disk and then back to the original unit disk it started with. You can combine both of these automorphisms and rotate your phi sub alpha image. So imagine centering at alpha and then rotating, and that would be a combination or the composition of these two, which leads to a very important theorem that actually all automorphisms can be written as a composition of the rotation and phi sub alpha. So the theorem says if f is in the automorphism of D, then f can be written as the composition, as you can see, of the, ro the rotation and phi sub alpha for any real theta and an alpha contained inside the disk. Next, we will look at Schwartz's lemma and a very easy, understandable way to prove it. So the lemma says that if f is a function that maps the unit disk to itself and f is holomorphic and maps zero to zero, then three statements follow. The first one says that f is bounded by the input z. The second one says that if f of z is equal to the modulus of z for some z, then f is a rotation. And the last one says that the derivative of f at zero is bounded by one and if there's an equality with that, then f is a rotation. The kind of shortcut, quick way I like to think of this theorem is that we have two different bounds and two different ways to express a rotation. So the two bounds are that f of z is bounded by z and the derivative at zero is bounded by one and we have a rotation if either of those are equal. One thing to note is that the assumption in the Schwartz lemma is not equivalent to saying that f is an automorphism because note that an automorphism implies that f is also bijective, but we don't need that. We do have an additional assumption though that zero maps to zero. So pulling out our picture before, we can see that phi sub alpha is actually a function where we cannot apply Schwartz lemma because it does not map zero to zero. However, if we do take the 
composition, then we do have a map from zero to zero. Now we will prove this lemma. The first part we are trying to prove is that f of z is bounded by modulus of z. So since f is holomorphic, we can easily write it as a power series expansion centered at zero. Since we know that f of zero is equal to zero, then plugging that in, we end up with a zero is equal to zero. So really, f can be written as a one z, etc. And if we divide by z, we can see that we have another holomorphic function since we have another function written as a power series expansion. And we will call this function g, and we know it's also holomorphic. Since f is a function from the disk to itself, we know that every output of f has to be bounded by 1. And also, we know that z has to be bounded by 1, but specifically, since it is inside the disk, we can just assign wherever z is equal to r, and we will see why in a second. So then the modulus of g is equal to the definition plugged in, and since the modulus of z is equal to r, we're just going to set that equal to each other, and then we have that that whole thing is bounded by 1 over r. Here's where the maximum modulus principle comes into play. We know that g of z is bounded by 1 over r, when z is on the boundary of a disk with radius r. By the maximum modulus principle, if we attain a maximum on a boundary, then it also must be true that that same maximum is in the interior. So we can also say that that statement must be true for z inside less than r. But we want it to be the case for all z inside the unit disk, so we want z to be less than 1. So we let r go to 1, and then we have that the modulus of f divided by the modulus of z is less than or equal to 1, which multiplying both sides by the modulus of z, we get our result that we were hoping for. Moving on, we will prove the second part. In the second part, we let z0 be an element of d such that we have equality between f of z0 and z0. And then we can just divide both sides by z0, and we have that that must be equal to 1, which is the maximum, because any maximum obtained has to be 1 since we're inside working inside the unit disk. And since it's obtained in the interior, since z0 is in the interior of d, the maximum modulus principle says that the maximum can only be obtained on the, um, on the boundary, and if it's not, then that function must be a constant. And so f of z over z must be a constant, we'll name it c, where the modulus of c is equal to 1. Since the modulus of c is equal to 1 and we're working with a complex number, we can express c as e to the i theta for some real theta. So then we can rewrite f of z as e to the i theta z, which clearly shows that f is a rotation, which is what we wanted. Now for the last part of our proof, we want to show that the modulus of the derivative of f at 0 is equal to 1. So we'll plug in the definition, and we know that f of 0 is equal to 0, so we can ignore that part, and we end up with the limit as the approach is 0 of f of z over z, um, which is really just the function g defined at 0. And we know it has to be bounded by 1 because we are working inside the unit disk. So now we want to show um, that if there is equality, then we have a rotation. So first we're going to show that if we know that there's equality, then the g defined at 0 is equal to 1 since those are equal to each other. And if g defined at 0 is equal to 1, again, by the maximum modulus principle, we have that g is a constant. And following the same logic as before, we know that g f is a rotation. Now we're going to prove the other way. If f is a rotation, then we can rewrite f of z as e to the i theta times z. We'll take the derivative, we'll plug in 0, take the modulus, and that concludes our proof for Schwartz lemma.